Hi, Nils. Welcome Hi. to the podcast on Everyday Metallurgy. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks for inviting me. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, quite an honor when you look at the people that you've already had. So, uh, yeah, Thank I look you. forward to this. Yeah. Yeah, Nils, I have I invited you because you have been uh, working a lot with solidification of metals, uh, yeah. but not only uh, practically, but also on simulations. And uh, what I really love is uh, when people make simulation and calibrate them uh, with the real world. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, uh, I would like to learn something about uh, how was it? How did it go? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Does the real world do as we simulate, or uh, or do we have to calibrate it? Um, but but first, uh, I would like to learn a little more about Nils. Uh, yep. Could you give an introduction to to who you are, uh, where you are positioned today, uh, and how you became uh, the one you are today? I can try at least on some of the things. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I I think actually I've listened to some of the other podcasts and, and it's interesting to hear what people say, how they started. And a lot of people came into metallurgy by accident. Um, and I came into metallurgy by accident. Um, I had okay. no idea what I was going to study um, when mm -hmm. I was looking for educations. And I actually were choosing between uh, engineering, physics, history and English. Um, <laughs> it was uh, yeah pretty pretty random and i sort of looked up and said okay engineering yeah why not and and so i ended up in mechanical engineering because it was versatile it was sort of i was afraid of limiting uh, cutting things away so it was something open and and um uh, so i came into um mechanical engineering, as it was called back then, which is very broad. And in the beginning, I thought I was going to do solid mechanics. Um, and um, because that's probably the first time I had courses that I where I thought I was actually quite good. Uh, and suddenly I ran into somebody that you also know, uh, Vaughn Buchwell, who is hmm. a very well-known lecturer at DTU. He's a very, very good lecturer and and uh, one of the grand old men in, in, in Danish metallurgy. Yeah, the metallurgical father in Denmark. Yeah, <laughs> and and his lectures were just fantastic. Um, he, yeah, very, very, very interesting. And uh, I think after one term with fundamental metallurgy, I was thinking, I have to do more of this. Um, and and from there on, I sort of just dived into it, and I realized that there is, I found a world that I didn't know existed. Um, and and I think one of the great attractions in metallurgy is that it's uh, it's the detective work, that you get a piece of material, and somebody says, well, this thing failed, and we have no idea why it failed, and then you start, you know. Just looking at it, you pick up a magnifying glass, then you go to the microscope, go through all these things, you do analysis, chemical and all that, and gra gradually build a crime scene, so to speak. And you figure out mm. what has happened, what are the reasons, what could be, and maybe you also add some modeling, you try to calculate if this happens, what could the result be, or all these different scenarios, and finally you come to the conclusion, well, right, this is what happened. I, and, and I think that detective work is super fascinating. And, and, and it's been, I think, driving a lot of what I what I do, uh, basically from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I, I ended up also by accident in steels. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, it, I wanted to work with electron microscopes and I was offered a project on weldings of uh, high strength low alloy steels and uh, so so that was just by accident and the next step was when I did my master's project my supervisor was very close with the steelworks in Frederikswerk and uh, I, I remember the meeting I went to his office and said I uh, Lange I need to do a project I want it to be a full year master project um, and with an industry. And he picked up the phone and uh, rang the guys at the steelworks and says, I have a student, he wants to do something. 
find a project we are visiting tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I did my master's on continuous casting of uh, of steel, uh, which was where I, from the metallurgy, was introduced to modeling because half of the time I spent on modeling solidification in uh, continuous casting. And um, I was involved with uh, Preben Hansen, who is also one of the grand old men in, in uh, modeling in Denmark and probably in the world. Yeah. And he introduced me mm. to some fundamentals, the fundamentals of modeling. And uh, I realized that there is the coupling between good experiments and useful models uh, really provide some very, very strong tools to analyze processes. Mm. Um, and I don't do so much modeling anymore, but but I work with very good modeling people. And, and I think the way that we support each other really gives us some fantastic opportunities. So, uh, yeah, so that was the introduction. And, and, and uh, I then came to Risu to work on metal powders, gas atomization and uh, metal powders for powder metallurgy. Um, and <laughs> pardon? Yeah, it's my home. Field. Yes, exactly. And there were some really big powder metallurgy research projects back then in the uh, early 90s. Uh, <clears throat> and I was a small part of that. Um, and my supervisor was the same person that introduced me to modeling. And he then brought me to another company uh, in the industry where I worked for four years, I think, uh, in um, supporting uh, foundries, in uh, setting up, uh, running in production plants and uh, teaching uh, industrial customers how to yeah, run foundries and in metallurgy and, and, and all those uh, sort of fundamental things. Um, and, and, and during that work, I was heavily involved in cast iron. Uh, because yeah, foundry is one of the big products is cast iron. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So and that was our mm. customer base. So so I came into that, um, and and later there was a position in foundry technology at DTU. So I moved to DTU where I've been for nearly twenty five years. Cool. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, you don't look uh, that old. <laughs> well, it's a it's a filter. <laughs> <laughs> Artificial intelligence or something like that. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, and all the while, all the while I've been here, I've worked with the modeling guys, but also very close uh, with Danish and international industries. So so I think I've never, I've always loved to work with the industries and and that coupling between research, also fundamental research, but with the people that actually need the results. I think that's it's it's very giving. It's it's so good to see that that you know people can use what you're doing. Yeah. That's uh, so, also uh, the the place where I know you from uh, yeah. collaboration be between us and yeah. uh, and you at the university. Yeah. And and so, yeah. Yeah, and and today uh, your position at uh, DGU is called. I am that, professor? associate professor. Associate professor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm. And of course, I, as an associate professor, I other than research, I also do a lot of teaching. So I'm, I have for many years been involved in uh, making new young metallurgists and uh, manufacturing engineering uh, uh, engineers. Um, so, yeah. I think I've, in, in, in that way, academia is, is nice because you, you are connected with a lot of people and there's big versatility in, in, in what you do. Um, uh, yes, thank you. And yeah. to, to catch that, uh, uh, I've also asked if you could kind of give a lesson uh, today <laughs> uh, because uh, Normally, these uh, podcasts are just uh, a chat where we talk and discuss. Mm. But uh, I have seen some photos and some videos 
uh, of uh, solidification that you have shown, and they are so fantastic. So therefore, I have asked if you could present some of that today. So yeah, it's not only you and me. It, it's also something from the real world. Yeah, um, something perhaps pretty. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> could be possible. Yeah. So, so Nils, uh, have have you prepared uh, some some slides and some videos? Uh, yeah, that I, you, you and, share and with the, me. Actually, I, I had fun with this because when you asked me to, I have twenty five years worth of videos, and and uh, to go back, and <laughs> uh, I have picked out some of our own, but I also found some really cool stuff from the internet, not from the internet, but from other researchers that I use in teaching. Mm. And I think are, are super mm. cool to show, uh, to explain some of the effects of solidification. And um, yeah, I have a, a range of things. So so the question is, where do we start? Um, sort of, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, could, could we start with the uh, cast iron? Because I know that you have been working a lot uh, with cast iron and, and simulation and calibration of these simulations. Yep, uh, I can do that. Um, in that case, I need to share. Maybe a, while I look for the, sh the share button, I can say that, um, hang on, this is the one that I want to share, and then I need to show a slideshow. Come on, there we are. And then we need to go to the top. Sorry about this. Uh, some of the first things that we started with at the university, and that actually started back when I was at DISA in the industry, was to look into cast iron. And back in the, that's around the millennium change, that uh, theoretically, at least, you could calculate that if you look at the properties, strength and ductility, stiffness of cast iron compared to aluminium alloys, cast iron would actually win, providing you could make the alloys thin-walled enough. Mm. And we made some experiments where we tried to figure out how do you cast really thin-walled cast iron. And we did a lot of ex practical experiments because, again, you said you can model a lot of things and get really nice pictures, but um, does it work? Mm. So we did a lot of experiments where we calibrated uh, numerical models on uh, uh, filling and solidification. And what we did is what I showed on the left here. A lot of experiments yeah. put a glass plate in front of a sand mold and then we pour cast iron into it. And you can do high speed recordings and look at the and images and analyze flow and cooling. Mm. Yeah. And it's, what is the thickness of, of the structures? The one I show here is just an example, but we it was actually a gating system we designed for a um, thin-walled manifold, and we managed to make a four-cylinder manifold with a wall thickness of two millimeters in cast iron yeah. um, with dimensional accuracy of uh, what, about a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, yeah. Which I think I th I actually think was pretty impressive and and um, yeah so, and we worked a lot with the gating system the methodology the accuracy in making molds we did all the details and and I had some very good PhD students who who worked on this so um, yeah there was this uh, trial what kind of cast iron uh, was it this was ductile cast iron because we needed something that had the quality of steel so. We needed proper high quality materials and and uh, so so uh, and and that was ductile and that was the big thing at the moment the wind turbine industry was looking into it and and a lot of the automotive industry was using it so we did a lot of work on how to cast but we also did a lot of work on the materials processing the chemical uh, yes. uh, uh, composition and also the melt treatment and and things like that and yeah, we because, made, uh, yeah. as, as I remember, uh, when when you solidify cast iron, the uh, shrinkage 
is a function of uh, uh, how fast it solidifies or, or or what kind of microstructure you create. So exactly. you can control the yeah. the shrinkage uh, to a certain level, but if you solidify very fast in some place and very slow in other places in your structure, then you have two different shrinkage rates. Is that right? Exactly. Then you then you get uh, uh, solidification carbides. You get litoborite, which mm -hmm. is essentially car white cast iron, and that shrinks like steel. Yeah. So you need mm. the graphite to expect to to form and then expand. And I'll show a video a little later on how that goes. Yeah. And that because solidification of well solidification in 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 uh, in uh, the process in industrial processes is always a non-equilibrium uh, process. On a good day, it's sort of a steady state, but everything is driven by heat extraction uh, and kinetics of solidification. We we have phase diagrams that guide us, but what happens in practice never follows the actual phase diagram. It's close, but uh, always a little bit off. So, so to condition the melt and nucleation and formation of graphite, for instance, in cast iron, becomes in really, really important. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah. in in this trial, did you also calibrate this with, uh, or, or did did you make simulations and then calibrate these simulations with the video you show? We did it the other way around. We actually did the experiments and then went back and modeled it to see how close we could get. Some of the things that there are two things, there's temperatures and there's flow. And for temperatures, mm. I can show a short video. One of my master students did many years ago in the Czech Republic with we cast high chromium white iron. At in this case, at 1420 degrees, we can see the melt is hot. It feels really nice. If we wait a little bit and pour at a lower temperature, you can see the temperature gradients here quite nicely. Here's a feeder, high temperature, retains the heat for a long time. Wow. The flow heats the material here. Here it's cold. So you actually can see yeah. the variation in cooling rate and the re resulting variation in mechanical properties in the material. Here we are at a lower temperatures and you can see... Is it 100 degrees lower? Yeah. 80 degrees, and you can see the material yeah. solidifies before it fills. It solidifies so, too early. Yeah. So mm. we see some very cool stuff just by making videos. Mm. This is old. You can do much, yeah. much better things today with videos. But but uh, here is, it's in German. I'm sorry about that, but it's from a German lecture I did uh, many years ago. Uh, but here we can see we're making break disks. As shown here up in, in, in figure G. And uh, we have a gating system that leads the melt into the break disk. And we can see at the comparison between the computer model and the frames from the video. There's not an exact match. There never will be. But, but I think the match is pretty OK, everything taken into account. I can see some of the numbers go wrong here. Sorry about that. But basically, we can see that the filling sequence matches up quite well and what is really interesting is when the melt hits this dead end as we see here we can actually see the colors on the modeling shows the pressure in the melt and we can see when the melt hits the dead end a pressure builds up and that pressure travels backwards into the casting so the melt explodes into the casting and we see in the video exactly the same happening. We see melt droplets mm. thrown into the casting. It's difficult to see on the pictures. Yeah. It doesn't look exactly the same because it's yeah. so chaotic. But we mm. see the same effects. Yeah. And we were actually, it took a long time to work on boundary conditions and, and meshing and other stuff. But we could actually set up so that we got realistic uh, 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 simulation results that matched with the uh, with the experiments, and since then, yeah. modeling has become much better. Uh, we get much better results today. It's much easier to do today, but mm. that was sort of at least from these, the beginning. Uh, these splats uh, you, you you said that, that are formed. Uh, yeah, could we call them splats? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, 
uh, what what do they do? Uh, do they disturb or are they remelted uh, when when you fill up the cavity afterwards? Uh, or this, or this do is, they stay on the wall? They, I mean, they solidify. So basically, you are throwing metal pellets into your casting. Let them solidify, hmm. and of course, they will either glue to the wall or they will fall down, fall down, hit the melt again. Hmm. Maybe they will remelt because the melt is hot enough and be integrated. Mm. If not, they will create defects of one way or the other. Mm. In this case, mm. it's cast iron, and, and cast iron is in that respect much more forgiving than um, steel, for instance, or aluminium, uh, bronze, or, or, or those alloys. So if you can remelt the particles, they will be integrated. But had it been a steel casting, yeah. this would be horrible. You will be, yeah. The perfect way to create defects. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah. So a lot, a lot of the stuff we do is is matched up with uh, numerical modeling, and and as I said today, I have many colleagues that do modeling, and they're so much better than I am, and than I will ever become. That I will stay with the experimental, and then we can work together and compare notes. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. Then uh, I, I know that you have also been looking into other alloy systems. Yep. Uh, and not, not only cast for iron. two minutes. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, I have also seen some uh, solidification uh, uh, videos or, mm -hmm. or uh, photos where you look at it on micro scale yeah. so you can see the individual dendrites forming yeah. uh, it, yeah it was made in the maybe the world's biggest microscope <laughs> uh, <laughs> a, a, yeah. a big uh, um, machine to to produce uh, uh, very high sensitive, uh, how high power X-ray. Yep. Uh, so can can you tell a little about? Uh, I can what, I can what, do what I can do that um, scanner. Yeah, that's and that's of course much more into the fundamental method, ways of solidification. Um, I have some videos that I borrowed from others that really illustrate what takes place during solidification. I think they're 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 definitely worth to look at. And then I have some of our own stuff, which is again on ductile cast iron. Uh, the good thing about ductile cast iron is it contains graphite, which makes lovely contrast when you do X-ray videos. Uh, so yeah. it's uh, actually when we started, when I presented it to the guys at the synchrotron, they said, yes, this is the perfect material to work with this. So we got a lot of free time. Yeah. <laughs> mm. um, uh, the the reason why I'm asking is that I have uh, uh, some years ago been contacted and asked uh, well, Denmark is a part of building this new uh, synchrotron uh, system in in Lund in Sweden, yeah. and uh, we have access to it uh, from Danish industry. Don't you have some tasks? Yeah, and I was just like, oh, I have no idea on how to use that. Um, but but what you have shown me gave me some insight in how that actually can be yeah. used. Uh, so that was why I'm, I'm very curious to, yeah. to, to share that with uh, other I, people as well, because it's it's very complex to understand what what do you really build such a big machine for and then look into microscale. Yeah. And I think I think the issue from a metallurgical point of view with the one max four in, in loan is it's it's brilliant. It doesn't have enough light to do steels and iron properly to get resolution to see the microstructure. Uh, you could at least not for solidification and for what we have looked at. It can done a lot of a lot of really nice other things, but uh, we cooperated with uh, a group in Britain and worked on the diamond light source, which is the British synchrotron. And they have specific lines designed to study uh, metals and particularly iron, nickel and cobalt alloys and things like that. So we were lucky to get in with that group. And because mm. what we did was quite novel, we actually got uh, a lot of free time. And I mean, 
free time. We're talking, if you had to pay for it, we, we're talking about, um, I don't know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of euro. Um, but because when you come up with an experiment that's interesting enough, you can actually apply okay. and get uh, free time. Uh, okay. And the guys from Britain, they had some super cool equipment that we could use. So basically, we could come up with the experiments and the samples, and they had some cool equipment that I can uh, show in a few minutes. So yes. if I... Um, That'll be nice. Uh, yeah, hang on. Um, how do I... I need to share again. Let me just find it. What I think I will do... Uh, no, I'll show that, and then I'll come back to solidification later. Uh, um some of the more fundamental in, in in solidification later and i just need to start the slideshow here we go so we're looking at re the problem with x-rays is that when you when they hit metals they are uh, either reflected or slowed down so if you have too much metal the x-rays will not penetrate they may penetrate and then you may not get proper resolution and we're talking resolution we, we we're, we're down to less than five micron in resolution so we make very small samples this is cast iron two millimeters in diameter yeah. and eight millimeters maybe in length it sits on a rotating yeah. stage this is the tip of the uh, sample holder it sits yeah. on this stage and it can yeah. rotate and then and, and do you melt it yes so oh. we have actually up here, you can see that square thingy that sits in here is actually a furnace yeah. that can be lowered onto okay. this. So this little sample gets to sit mm. inside the furnace. And then we have high intensity uh, X-rays shot through it. So we get, yeah. well, X-ray images. You can see the sample here. This is the sample holder, the furnace. X-rays coming in, goes through the uh, sample. Uh, hang on, it comes the other way. So the X-rays comes from left to right, and then we have the detector here. So we make basically 2D images. Uh, but when the sample rotates, every time you have a bit of rotation, you take a new picture, and then you build up a 3D structure uh, mm -hmm. like this. Yeah, you can see the sample inside the furnace. Um, and we can heat to 1400 degrees in this one, which is much more okay. than we need for uh, mm. for cast iron. And these uh, Asim and Peter Lee are people that actually developed the furnace bit of it and had access to the uh, to the uh, synchrotron. And then we had a group here at DTU that uh, did the uh, the work together with those guys. And they made a nice video of how it works in practice. I can show that here. From the left, the X-ray beam. Here is our sample and a section through the furnace. The red is the heating element. And then the sample rotates. As you can see here, the sample rotates. X-rays goes through and we acquire a lot of images. Those mm -hmm. images can be stacked and form 3D uh, images. And then you have 3D volumes that you can play as a video, as it's shown here. And this sounds very, very simple. And in theory, it's very, very simple. But to get from the experiment to the first image takes uh, three months. <laughs> and then you have something well, that is shown more or less shown on the right here, a stack of 2D images with time. Here we have a section through the sample, and you can see in this case, all the black dots, most of the black dots are graphite that form. And then you have to stitch it together to 3D geometries, and you have to segment and, and pick out the graphite. So in the end, you end up with a video that is shown here. You can see graphite forming at different time steps mm. during solidification. And then you can go and isolate specific areas and say, let me look at, for instance, the center area, take all the particles there, look at them, at what time, what temperature do they form, how quickly do they grow, if they are not spherical, do they grow faster in other directions, in some directions than other, and you can do a lot of analysis. 
So we did that, and then we also had some numerical models that predicts uh, solidification of ductile iron and held it against the results. And, and in the end, we did some modifications to those models to actually uh, make them match uh, what we see in practice. So yeah, good fun. Uh, so, so yeah, so here the dendrites you, you see in the back, they were formed first. Yeah. And, and, and then afterwards the, the graphite grow. Yeah. And in this case, we cannot show the dendrites simply because the because the size of the sample, it, it sounds stupid. We have a, 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 yeah, 1.8 millimeter, maybe two millimeter sample. And that mm. is so thick in size that we are not able to differentiate the dendrites from the melt. Uh, <laughs> we did a lot of work on it. Maybe That's why can, the, but... the graphite are so good because they have a, yeah. such a different uh, density. Yeah. And this is, I mean, it's a uh, cast iron is a composite material with steel and mm. carbon and or steel and graphite. Yeah. And, and, and those two materials are so different. You really see them well in, in, in X-rays. Mm. Then we met up with some Japanese colleagues that did some other experiments. And, and mm. basically, let's just start with this picture. We see here a cast iron sample. Here's a temperature where everything is liquid. Blue line, we cool down. And here the dendrites form. We can see we should see dendrites similar to what is sketched here. At this point, graphite nuclease, and that's what we just saw in the video that we had. And we also know because it's a dynamic process, we have an undercooling relative to what's predicted by the phase diagram. Then we have graphite, the black dots forming, and we have austenite forming around those. And we get gradually more and more graphite and austenite as we follow the cooling curve until the point here where everything is solidified. So everybody that had looked and at... Yeah? Uh, and, and when looking at the curve, it, it goes up again. The temperature goes up again. Yes. Uh, and uh, uh, I am so happy that I'm allowed to ask uh, the stupid questions. <laughs> uh, yeah. why, why does the temperature rise again? when you solidify? Well, it's basically it's because all phase transformations and solidification is, of course, a phase transformation. With all solidification, solid, all phase transformations goes the heat of transformation, which is if you hold your hand over a pot of boiling water, you would get scalded. And that's because the evaporation heat, the heat of evaporation, when the material condenses on your hands, it releases the extra heat of evaporation and provides a lot of energy to your hands. If you go the other way, afterwards you want to remove it, you put it under a fan and your hands are cooled excessively because of the heat of evaporation that is extracted from your hands. It's exactly the same with solidification. So when the material begins to solidify, when the solid material grows, it evolves heat. At the same time, we are cooling. So we are extracting heat and we're involving heat. So it's always a balance between those two things. And when graphite should form on the green line here, but graphite does not form easily. So you need an undercooling to start the nucleation. And this is the undercooling. Mm. But by the time the graphite forms, you are so much below the equilibrium temperature that it grows really fast. Mm. And of course, it releases energy, temperature increases, there's a peak. At the end, as you can see, there's so little liquid, it cannot generate heat. Mm. But we're still extracting heat, so the temperature drops. So it's mm -hmm. this balance between extraction of energy and formation of energy in the process. Mm. And so the, if you, uh, yeah. So the undercooling to form the, uh, the the graphite that is also controlled uh, the, the, the the span you can control that by adding nucleation powder exactly so you, you and, it's a big business <laughs> why you that's why you add magnesium no actually i add magnesium to form the to make sure the graphite becomes nodular spherical uh -huh. so that's the so first part nucleation sites then you add 
what's called inoculants that contain aluminium, calcium, zirconia, barium, lots of other things that is tuned specifically to your use. So if you're making thin wall castings, you use one type of inoculants because you have high cooling rate. If you're doing heavy section castings, you have lower cooling rates, you need to adapt to that. It's big business producing inoculants okay. because it's one of the most yeah. important parts of, of, of creating the microstructure that we need. So, but what is sketched on the on the graph here, we did some uh, Japanese friends that have the expertise to make 2D X-ray videos. They did, uh, in, in this case, we're looking at a 200 micron thick cast iron sample, and we're looking in two dimensions through it. And what we see here is liquid. There's a lot of noise, some white dots and stuff. Uh, but then we see in a minute, Dendrites, the first austenite, what we see on the right on the graph. And then we will see very shortly white dots, which is the graphite. And we can see because the dendrites contain a lot of iron, there will be a lot of carbon in the melt. And of course, the graphite forms in the melt. We also see that graphite is lighter than the liquid, so it floats. Uh, <laughs> It's still solidifying. And all these things have been discussed and debated in the literature over many, many years. What does it actually look like? So this is one of the first videos that actually shows it. Mm. It was, yeah, quite nice. Quite cool. It was done during COVID. And uh, okay. the friends in Japan, they were at the Japanese synchrotron doing the experiments. And we were uh, visiting from by it over teams from the UK and from Denmark. It was just a few days before Christmas and a Friday night. We were all sitting there on teams and looking at the experiments. Can you do this? Can you do that? And gradually we saw these videos appearing. It was really nice. It's very exciting. And, and the time frame, <laughs> it, it says 846 seconds. Yes. Is that real time? That is real time. Oh. So it's super slow. Yeah. But you need you need enough images, you need enough X-ray to actually have uh, proper resolution and contrast in your in your images, and therefore things really have to go slow. Um, with the technology available today, that this is this is what we get. Um, yeah, but it was nice. It was yeah, we were it was we were really happy that uh, that Friday night. But it was weird because normally we would sit in the same room and do everything together, but we couldn't do it here. But uh, yeah, it was a great party. <laughs> mm. Yeah, <laughs> and that comes back to the motivation for doing this: is when when things like this, when you have success with this, it takes those two cylinder, two millimeter diameter samples. It took three or four months just to make the first sample that works. Then you have a week at the synchrotron where you work 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, we did maybe 20 or 25 experiments and two of them were successful, something like that. So you oh. put so many hours into it. So when something finally comes out of the six as a success, it's fantastic. Mm. And you go home and it took, I think it took two months just to copy the data out of the uh, um server at the synchrotron onto a server in the UK so we could start to work with the images. <laughs> yeah, a lot of data. Yeah. So you go away for a week and come home with, I think, 15 terabyte uh, mm. pictures. Um, yeah. Then I... Uh, I, I know that you also have, uh, uh, I, I think it has been my favorite video of the last years uh, within Metallurgy. <laughs> uh, you, you show solidification uh, yeah. that creates internal stresses. No, I know. That, that, that would not be a problem. Yep. Um, and um, uh, I, uh, I don't, do, do you have, more you would like to show? Uh, I, maybe well, we should have end on that. <laughs> we uh, we can do that. I have uh, several things. Let me just find it. Um, 
because I, I think, think we should end on the uh, on, on my favorite video. <laughs> yeah, which one is that? <laughs> is that, that the stresses, that residual the, uh, stresses? Or? Yes, the the indium. Okay, yeah, right. So yeah. we can have a quick look at residual stresses and then go to the other thing if if uh, you're happy with that. Yep, that would be fine. Yeah, yeah. you you Let take me... control. <laughs> Again, <laughs> let, let me just share. This is uh, it's actually from some slides I did recently in relation to work on laser powder bit fusion. So sorry, I have to scroll. But one of the issues when you uh, have have hot and cold materials, uh, whether it's a mold with a cold surface and a hot melt, so it solidifies from the surface to the center. The bits that solidify first, of course, contract. And the bits that solidify later will stay liquid. But at the time where they solidify and contract, you have different thermal expansion and uh, you get residual stresses in the material. On the right here, we see it's from laser powder bit fusion printing, 3D printing, metal 3D printing of materials. We have a laser that runs across a powder and melts. It's basically a welding. Uh, and you have cold material out here, hot material out here. When the melt solidifies, it contracts and draws the casting, or the, sorry, the, the weld or the 3D part together. Uh, yeah. In this case, it's a computer model of the stresses. When you cut your part off the uh, print uh, table, and you can see it's predicted how it should bend. And the second picture is um, measurement of how it actually bends and there's good cooperation. Mm -hmm. And it's the guy across the hall from where I have my office that, that did this work. But there were some guys at Volvo that uh, did a video to show that. And, and uh, yeah, I think they have fun in Sweden sometimes. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So they cast what is called a stress lattice. You have two thin bars connected mm -hmm. to a heavy, uh, thick bar at the center. We'll get to see a proper picture at it in a moment. Here's the casting they open. It's a bit difficult to see, but uh, we'll get a proper picture later. Here you see the heavy section and two thin bars. And of course the thin bars, they will solidify quickly, contract and build up strength. And then the center bit, solidifies and then it contracts and that means that the two thin bars become on are under pressure um yeah, yeah. so when you cut it this is what happens uh and i mean this is real residual stresses you will find it in weldings castings 3d printed materials and if you don't do anything they will sit there and uh yeah do wild things if you're not careful um, and I think this is really a very uh, impressive way of showing residual stresses because it, often you can't see them. Yeah, yeah. I know in at Olbo University they are working with uh, uh, laser forming. Yeah. So they use uh, laser to to heat one side of a plate, and then due to the uh, different cooling patterns yeah. on on each side. Uh, they can control the bending. Yeah. So instead of uh, being annoyed by the uh, internal stresses, they use them. Yeah. For a, for a purpose. Exactly. And it actually makes good sense. Uh, mm. If you find an old fashioned, an old blacksmith that uh, can forge or can do weldings, you mm. will find that they actually if they've tried it, they 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 can do these things that uh, apply a little bit of heat. If you have something made out of thin plate, it will bend and they can control that it bends into place. Yeah. Um, we had a good, a really good welder in our lab many years ago, mm. uh, and he showed me he welded something that was totally crooked. And he showed me, look at this, that beam is way off. And he took his welding torch, welded a bit of 10 centimeters on a six meter long beam, and it just went in bang right yeah. where it's supposed to be <laughs> so <laughs> uh the old guys knew how to do it um 
Yeah. We have to make computer models and uh, calculate uh, what they <laughs> what they did. Mm. So that's something on on residual stresses, um, mm. and it is super important. I mean, if you make thin wall castings, for instance, it's a huge problem that you need to control yeah. residual stresses. Otherwise, your dimensions are all over the place. Mm. So uh, yeah. Should we have a look at the uh, the last one you said? Yes, yeah. let's, uh, let's end on a high note. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. It's not something that uh, that I have been involved in, but it's available on the internet. But but let's just start. We need to look at the phase diagram. We need to be a little bit academic. Uh, okay. if, we, <laughs> if we look at a section of a eutectic phase diagram, if we have this an, an alloy with this composition C0, we know that it will begin to solidify at the liquidus temperature and solidification theoretically should be over and done with when we reach this point, which is the solidus temperature. But we also know if we're somewhere in between, you will have, if you're in this triangle, you will have two phases. You will have a solid phase with low alloy content and a liquid phase with a high alloy content. So it's basically separating. It's sort of liquid and solid becomes like oil and water, more or less. Um, mm -hmm. And we also see the more solute that we're adding to the liquid, the lower temperature, the lower solidification temperature do we have. So it's basically what we do when we put ice on the roads in winter. The milk will freeze or the, the water will freeze at 20 de uh, zero degrees. So we add yeah. salt. And we lower mm. the uh, solidus and liquidus temperatures. Um, so if we look at, and again, I've borrowed it, you can see where you can find it um, on this solidification.org. And at the bottom here, we have a cold surface. Up here, we have hot liquid. And if we run the video, we will see dendrites growing from the bottom from the cold side towards the hot side. And the colors, it's basically an X-ray video and it shows, the color shows difference in chemical composition. And we have gallium with 25% 20, indium. And the more indium we have, the more red the colors will be. So it's not, I mean, it's. I think it's colors that are added just to enhance the contrast, but but it shows really well what happens. And we see the phase diagram in action. Here we see blue dendrites, they have low indium content, just as we would expect. And in the liquid, all the indium is pushed into the liquid. And you can see this channel, there's so much liquid pushed in here that <laughs> the melting out. point decreases. And yeah, and we actually see here that the dendrites remelt they have already solidified because but because there's so much indium there the melting point decreases and they disappear again <laughs> sorry about that uh and we see this plume of indium dissolving yeah. material it's 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 very very pretty mm -hmm. uh so it's yeah, it's a video that shows the phase diagram, but it also shows some of the issues shows some of the issues with solidification because if you looked at the phase diagram, this should not be expected at all. But because we are pushing solute into the liquid, we are actually moving away from the phase diagram. And does a pattern like this also appear in in what we call normal alloys, alloys that we can meet on our daily life, uh, because I have never seen gallium indium alloys before. <laughs> it happens in all alloys. Basically, all the technical alloys we have, you find it. Uh, I think yeah. Steve, you, you're in your podcast with Steve on historical uh, steel production. He mentioned when the steel work mm -hmm. started to do scrap and they had copper mm -hmm. in the steel. They had lots of issues and it was exactly these issues. Copper was rejected to the liquid, lowering the melting point yes. locally. And you can mm -hmm. imagine if you in the liquid in here have uh, steel at 1500 degrees, and this is supposed mm -hmm. to be a 
close solid shell that holds the steel inside and you suddenly have a crack like this it will break out and you have liquid steel it's very very impressive i've seen it in in my master's mm. project uh, it comes from six meters height and you have a hundred ton of liquid steel that suddenly uh, like a shower comes out it's all burst over out. the place burst out yes yeah. so um yeah very very impressive but uh a little bit dangerous yeah. So is it called a hot tear when it breaks open? Well, this this in this case it will be a, a hot tear. In 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 steel production they call it breakouts because you have basically mm -hmm. you have a solid shell with liquid inside it, and when that yeah. solid shell bursts, it says, and you have, yeah, it is somehow cool, but uh, it's not so good for the steel works. Oh, <laughs> I uh, totally understand. <laughs> I yeah. I really love this uh, video. It's very beautiful. Yeah. I think, and, and again, I didn't do it, but um, mm. it's available also um, from this solidification.org homepage, which which is a homepage that uh, uh, a guy from Switzerland, a guy from the US have made. Uh, some of the old solidification guys, they collected videos from researchers and built a homepage where you can uh, go and have a look and see modeling and experiments so it's, it's it's a nice place thank you Nils. so um, i think yeah i will leave this here yes yeah yeah now at the end uh, i would like to connect this to uh, to to the future yeah uh, because so many young people they say uh, yeah, if you work with metal, it's uh, it's the old grey man who does that. Uh, we don't need that. We don't need to. Uh, metals has been developed, um, so we don't need that for the future. But uh, I would like to learn your perspective on that. Uh, do, do you see any future needs for for metal development? I think I see lots of things. Uh, first of all, I will say, if you look at the young generation, it's uh, it's not only men. There are uh, there's a good mixture of genders in in material science and, yeah. and in metallurgy. Mm. Uh, fortunately, uh, I think it's great that uh, we are able to attract lots of young people into this area. So so yeah, in in there's a good young generation coming up. I think you can say metals is known. We've known metals since God knows when. Uh, but but we have used, I mean, iron has been produced for more than 4,000 4, years and you had bronze for God knows how long. Uh, but if you took away metals, uh, well, I wouldn't be standing on the second floor of a house because the house would have crumbled. <laughs> Yeah. I wouldn't have a car. My bicycle would look like just a, two rubber tires and a saddle. Uh, so, <laughs> so we mm. sort of rely on metals, and and I think mm. looking into a world where we need to be sustainable, it becomes really there's there's some huge challenges in maybe not inventing everything a lot of new, but finding out a way how can we recycle what we have in a way that we use the minimum amount of resources uh, to to still sustain a, a reasonably uh, good life. Um, and and every I mean, I think Steve also was discussing it a little bit in his talk. But if you look at the prediction for what happens in the years to come, the need for steel is so large that we, even if we recycled everything we had, there's no way we could keep up with it. So yep. recycling is immensely important, but we also need to figure mm -hmm. out what do we do to sustainably produce new steel? Um, mm -hmm. I don't have any good answers, but there's some very, very interesting things to work with for the generation to come. Yep. And uh, everybody knows if uh, you work with- not, not only steel. All materials and actually steel, are yeah. the materials that we recycle the most all the other materials is much less there's much more to do but you can imagine if you recycle steel it's like if you have plasticine you have different colors when you were a kid modulia box 
have all these different mm -hmm. colors and you were doing things and after a few hours you mixed all your colors and you have a brown really brown. boring yeah. looking material <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> and the way we are recycling materials we're basically doing the same thing so we take all the iron, we separate it into some that's magnetic, some that's not magnetic. And then we just mix cast iron, chromium steels, uh, low alloy steels into something that is not very good to make uh, high quality materials out of. And to overcome that, we dig more iron out of the ground, refine it and dilute. Yeah. This is not sustainable. Yeah. So there's some there's a lot to do for young people and and very very important uh, uh tasks to be solved so i i, I see that as a as a future challenge that should be met very soon and you could do all the cool I stuff with understand. aerospace and 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 things you know there's lots to do <laughs> mm. yeah but uh i think digging into making refining green because as uh, as it is within steel, I think steel covers eight to nine percent of the world carbon emissions. Yeah. Um, steel manufacturing and eight percent of the nine are in the refining process. Yeah. Then the last one percent is all this uh, post processing, reheating, uh, and forging, yeah. and so on. Uh, so if you can solve the refining issue. And that covers yeah. steel, it covers aluminium, it covers copper, it covers uh, silicium. Yeah. Silicium yeah. for wafers is it's the same. Yeah. Uh, so, so if you want to be a digital master, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you need the uh, silicium for, for to make wafers. Yeah. Uh, if you want solar pa panels, so you need a lot of silicium for for those. Uh, uh, there's absolutely a lot to do out there. Yep, that's uh, de definitely. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think there's a, a, yeah, a good future. And, and, and I mean, at the moment, additive manufacturing, metal additive manufacturing is super hot. Um, and it will find its place in the industry also as a, as a production method. But I think... My experience is if we go 10 years down the road, metal additive manufacturing will also become mature, like all the other processes. Um, mm -hmm. So it will find it's 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 hot now. There's a lot of research in it. But in 10 years time, maybe it will be, of course, less hot. And but the yeah. big topic that still remains is sustainable uh, production, good recycling. Mm. That's pro yeah. pro pro that's not going to go away for a long time. Uh, I have a good friend who said uh, that uh, uh, additive manufacturing of metals, it's like uh, uh, settling a football team. Uh, <laughs> you need a very good goalkeeper. He has to be specialized in catching the ball. Then you need a uh, midfield who can run and run and run and run and run. Uh, and then you need uh, 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 one who can score, yep. uh, who can run extremely fast in very short time and then does nothing rest of the game uh, but right now we haven't set in the football team because uh, those we are working on are the young talents uh, at, at, at age 10 so yeah. we don't know who will grow up and be the champs <laughs> exactly so uh, <clears throat> yeah mm. and and i can see from from the from the industries that we're working with uh, that just in the past five years there's been a huge involvement. Five years ago, it was sort of a curiosity. Well, let's see what printers can do today. So today, they're much more focused. Well, we have these products that could maybe be interested to 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 do in in additive manufacturing, and they're much more uh, clicked on when it, when it comes to uh, possible uses and 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 issues that needs to be solved. But the, but the, yeah, there's still lots to do. And uh, yeah. And you know that uh, binder jetting happy. and sintering yeah. is also something that comes up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So thank you, Nils. Let's uh, end it here. 
Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, the lesson you gave. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I hope it was not too much of a lesson. And I was, uh, uh, but I was, I was allowed to ask mm -hmm. uh, also the stupid questions. <laughs> so That's thank true. you very much for, uh, yeah. for for teaching me. Have well, a thank fantastic you. day. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great, and uh, it's a it's a, a good company to be in with all the guys and girls that you already uh, interviewed. So thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah. yeah. See you. Cheers. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye.